Um, I hope everybody's doing okay. Uh, these are tough times. Um, Trish and I are here and join us here with you guys. Um, and we hope everybody's doing well. Uh, we're going to try to keep this an uplifting and happy webinar. <laughs> uh, so there are some cool ninja techniques that Trish is going to show. Um, but uh, we're going to just try to go right through this webinar and make it hopefully useful for you guys. So we are all ninja moves, Mike. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. All well long people need to know. All right. So let me go to trying this. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to pull up um, a PowerPoint. Let me just shut down some of this other stuff so it doesn't get in the way. Let me reserve Trish's on the side. Um, and then I'm going to go to this one here. All right, can you guys see that little square? Uh, let me just pull up the chat here so I can see you guys talking too. Move this so I can see what you guys are asking. Great. All right, so aptly named webinar, when should hits the fan? I think that's the first time I've ever sworn during a webinar. <laughs> Feels kind of good. Um, emergency defensive dog handling. That's what this is about. Uh, so I'm actually going to unplug my, this mic so you guys can. Um, thumbs up that you can still hear me, Trish. Awesome. All right. So this, just to give you an idea of what this webinar is about, this is on what to do when off-leash dogs approach your on-leash dog out in the environment, uh, when a dog tries to attack you, um, some ha leash handling skills. So a little bit for everybody, city environments, tight close quarter environments. Um, so I wanna preface this, that we're showing a bunch of techniques here that are for emergency, see the keyword there? Emergency handling. Um, we're gonna show some tools and things that we don't advocate for training purposes. We advocate them for emergency handling. So as you're watching this, just keep that in mind. You're gonna see some things that are uh, definitely not training techniques there for when a dog is actively trying to attack you or another dog or your dog rather um, and it applies to those situations so I'm going to show you this video here that um, will give you a little uh, taste so think about this being you and what you would do in the event that, uh, uh, that you encounter a couple off-leash dogs think about in your mind as you're watching this now slight trigger warning there's no real there's not a real nasty fight or anything just a couple dogs uh, barking at each other but um keep this in mind as you're watching this think about what you would do Get that pretty. Okay, back, back. Now, this is something I'm sure a lot of you guys have encountered. So we're gonna talk about how to deal with this kind of situation. Um, but just to answer one question I get a lot is what is defensive handling? What does that mean? It's just like defensive driving and it's gonna vary depending on the environment or context you're in. So uh, we always wanna be proactive when we're handling dogs, especially if our own dog has issues with things in the environment um, and people get good at it. So you guys living in the city get really good at handling well in the city because it's a much different environment than some of us living out in the uh, woods or somewhere where there's not a lot of other dogs or people. So keep that in mind as you're watching this, try to adjust what you're seeing here to your specific scenarios, your particular environments. So we're gonna cover some of these leash skills, but why do we want to have good leash handling skills? And I think this is so appropriate for the times right now when we're talking about social distancing and I've seen some things come across Facebook about like six feet bleeds, like people that own dogs that have a history of being reactive or aggressive, really understand this concept about social distancing. distancing. But um, people who have leash reactive dogs have been doing it a while. And the ones that are good at handling on a leash avoid the emergency scenarios so much more and they're much faster at handling the dog. So um, it all boils down to the milliseconds. I always, we always talk about that, Trish and I, during our seminars, that it really boils down to those very small increments of time you have to react on your, uh, with what you're doing in those emergency scenarios. So like you saw that first video, um, I need as much time by using the leash to get my dog out of there and to handle the oncoming dogs. So if I'm not handling the leash properly, if I'm not using the right skills, 
then I'm losing those milliseconds, which means the difference between a byte and not a byte. So one thing I do, and many of you guys know this, is while I'm handling leash, um, it's very short. Now this is completely counterintuitive to what a lot of you guys have been learning. Um, we want slack in the leash, but we want a short leash when we're defensively handling a dog. And the reason why is it buys us that time. It buys us the time to react if this dog attacks me or tries to attack something else, or if some off-leash dogs approach my dog, I'm gonna be able to handle much faster if I have the leash short. Um, and again, we need to have good, good leash handling skills to make sure it's kept slack because we know tight leashes are our enemy, right? So you see me handling the leash on the same side here. Um, and I'll show you why in just a moment. So this is basically what it looks like when I'm working with dogs. This is my past dog, Kenji. Um, whether you're on a rear clip, front clip harness, if you're using a wide flat collar, whatever you're using, the leash should be shorter uh, when you're in defensive handling necessary environments like the city or going for your walks when off-leash dogs are approaching or a propensity to approach. So this next video demonstrates what happens when the leash gets tight. And you'll see here, um, this is an actual previous client's dog that had issues with other dogs. This is a good example of when a leash gets tight, it's like pulling the trigger on a gun. It actually can make things much worse. So there's another argument for having good leash handling skills so we don't inadvertently create an issue. So as soon as the leash gets tight, that's when the dog uh, responds in that manner. And a lot of dogs will do that because one of the things we're doing often is removing the flight option. They feel the leash get tight and they can't get away from the thing, or we're adding frustration, building in that sort of barrier action there where uh, the leash is becoming like a barrier to movement. So here's some same side handling and the difference. So see, this is where a lot of us will hold the leash in the opposite hand, which is fine in most contexts, right? So remember, defensive handling scenarios, I'd rather have it on the same side because I'm able to react much faster. So if you're in your classes or you're in an environment where you don't have to worry about other stimuli and having to respond quickly, you can absolutely hold the loop end of the leash and the dog can be on six feet or 15 feet or 30 feet, whatever you're using it for. Uh, and on opposite sides, that's fine. Um, again, just for the purposes of this webinar, same side handling. So this is opposite side handling, which makes me lose valuable time. So if, I, if this dog was to try to bite me, I would lose too much time because I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to get that dog away from me. So you wanna make sure it's same side handling. So if this dog was to try to bite me, that dog wouldn't try to bite me. But if she did, um, if she was having a bad day, I'd be able to get her away from me very quickly. So very basic fundamental concepts there as you're watching there. So we'll continue to build on those. Um, now we're looking at more emergency techniques. So if the leash was in the wrong hand, I wouldn't be able to do a technique like this, so an emergency hip turn. Um, those of you that have shoulder injuries or issues with mobility, um, I find it a lot easier to, to use your hips because most of your strength is in your hips and that's your center of gravity area. So when you do those turns, if you picture locking your hand up against your hip, so hand to left hip, if we're doing tag teach, and then you take your other hand, hand over hand, you're gonna have a lot more strength and you can make those U-turns. Um, so here's what it looks like in action. Now, she's unfortunately trained pretty well, so she doesn't give me the same reaction as trying to pull a big dog away, but um, this gives you an idea of the concept.
And that's a, an example of a belly lock. That's something Trish does, um, where she's got it more. And it really is up to you where you center your hands, what's most comfortable for you, where what's where you have the most flexibility. Um, but that by just practicing that one technique, that can save you a lot of trouble if off-leash dogs are coming to you and you need to do a multitude of things, which I'll show you in the next few videos. Um, so this, all these things start building on each other. If you've got the uh, same side leash handling down and you practice your hip turns, you're now gonna be able to do same side handling with a hip turn as you do some of these next techniques that are coming up here. So very fundamental concept, but one that I find, especially for clients with large dogs that are um, lunging at something, it's, uh, it's a lifesaver to get them out of there. All right, so um, one proactive technique you can do if, you're, if your dog has issues with other dogs and you're in an area where somebody's got their off-leash dogs, they're like, don't worry, my dog's friendly. And they give you that kind of spiel that we've got to do something to get those dogs away. If my dog has issues, I don't want a dog fight to happen. Uh, one of the neighborly thing to do is what's, what's called the treat bomb. And most of you guys are being trainers. are going to have treats with you. So go in and grab a huge handful of treats and throw it right at the dogs that are coming at you, dog or dogs, as your first step. It's kind of the nicer thing to do before we move into some of the other techniques. One little other key concept there is the inside U-turn. Um, so when you're turning away, now we all heard the emergency U-turn, right? Just switch if the dog's on your left side, you make that right turn. You gotta be careful with that because now I'm placing my dog in direct line of fire there. And they're kind of be, gonna be looking right at the, the thing coming on, whether it's a person or other dogs. So get good at inside U-turns as well as your emergency U-turn. Those are the things you're gonna to wanna to train, of course, before you try to put that in place during an emergency scenario. But if I got the leash on the same side, I'm able to do that a lot easier than if I'm cross-body leash handling, right? So, um, so here it is again. So she's kind of behind me too, that's another concept, is to have teach dogs to get behind you if there's off-leash dogs coming at you. Because if she's way out in front of me at all six feet of the leash, it's really very difficult to deal with that scenario. I can't often use the treat bomb because I'm not going to be, it's going to be kind of almost falling right in front of my own dog as the other dogs are approaching. So positioning is really important. So I've got her slightly behind me and to the left and I'm allowed I'm kind of placing myself to deal with the oncoming dogs. So these off leash dogs are running. I'm able to do this. And then when I make that turn, I go left rather than right. And I just noticed something as I was playing that back. Another little thing here, you can see where it, she's trying to dart around me to my right, but again, because the leash is short enough and I've got her on the same side, it prevents her from actually doing that. All right, moving up on or down the ladder, um, we could also use um, visual blockers that find pop open umbrellas, very helpful. Uh, so you see this concept here, you just get it. Now, when you're using an umbrella or really any kind of visual uh, blocker, make sure you desensitize your own dog to it first or your client's dog, because if you pop that thing open next to some dogs, they can get really freaked out by it. So um, make sure you, you know do the typical uh, slow conditioning route. If you're on the other side of the living room, you pop open the umbrella, you give your dog a handful of cookies and you know just repeat that process so it's not a scary event for uh, your dog. Now the nice thing about umbrellas too is that it blocks the visual. So, you know, so you're blocking some of that visual stimulus for your own dog. You can even use it in a pinch as a visual block so your dog doesn't go to starting to react towards the stimulus approaching. Um, so you can have that proactively ready or even open and use it if you're in a tight city environment or place where um, there's uh, not a lot of places where we can create distance, which we would normally do with a lot of our dogs that have issues with other dogs or people. Um, you might get some weird looks in some states, you know, if it doesn't rain much, uh, but I find that that technique is very helpful for some clients. Next up, what do you do with small dogs? <laughs> this one always gets a lot of laughs, but it totally works. Um, if you are ever in an emergency scenario and you have a small dog, do not pick it up and hold it. 
right? So that's very dangerous for you and your small dog, especially if it's a large group of dogs. Um, and they, they will often start jumping up and grabbing at whatever little limb they can grab. So use your environment. Remember that saying, use your environment. Um, I've had trainers actually message me or email me about that term, use your environment, because that's what they remember to do. Um, we had that, that uh, so I, I don't, can't remember the trainer's name. She had um, somebody with a, the, some coyotes actually trying to come after a dog. She used a stick. She didn't think about it, but she's like, use the environment. She found a stick. You use that to be able to uh, fend off any kind of attack. Um, so, and I have, I have clients that are so worried about their small dogs because they've been attacked that they literally only walk the dogs on garbage day because there's plenty of opportunities to just there's plenty of safe havens in a sense, especially if they live in an area where there's a lot of off-leash dogs. So car, on top of cars, if you're walking downtown, don't be afraid to just open up somebody's storefront. Oh, there you go. You're going shopping for a minute while uh, the other dogs go away. Um, so uh, use the environment. Uh, leash windmill. This one is, um, again, moving down the ladder in terms of what might be um, immersive to a dog, but this can be uh, used as a visual blocker first in terms of making the other dog go away, uh, but it also kind of, be, kind of becomes a physical barrier for you uh, between you and the other dog. Again, the emergency scenarios only. Because sometimes that's all you have is the leash. If you happen to go out of your house without the right tools or if you don't have treats or something, most of the time you're gonna have a leash on your dog so you can use that. Um, again, another thing you wanna desensitize your dog to, um, but you start spinning the leash very rapidly uh, and most dogs will shy away from that. And sometimes you actually make contact with the dog if, if it's a real emergency scenario, but that may be the only thing you have. And Trish and I always mention that the first thing you stick in front of a dog's mouth is usually what they're gonna bite. So if I've got the leash and I want the oncoming dog to bite onto something, I'll give them that leash and I'll deal with the emergency with some of the other tools you see upcoming in just a moment. All right, here's um, a slide. Uh, I should have it say emergency. So, so in case anybody screenshots this thing, they're like, Trish and Mike are talking about these tools. Uh, so these are emergency tools only guys, right? So some of them of course were designed for training, but we don't advocate for training with any of these tools. These are for emergencies. Uh, for when you're out and about and you might have a dog attack happen. So either to you, if you're walking by yourself, or you and your dog uh, get attacked. Um, I'll show you how Spray Shield operates in just a moment. Um, these are noise deterrents. The pet corrector it makes a hissing noise, like a keyboard cleaner. This one will uh, alert everybody in the neighborhood that you're having a problem because it's very loud. Uh, it's a noise deterrent. Now keep in mind that this one and this one will also affect your own dog. So, um, but what can happen is you have this, you have the spray shield or even have HALT, which is a pepper spray based deterrent. A lot of mail carriers use that. Um, those are more directable to the oncoming threat. Sometimes though, these don't work. So that's why I often recommend an additional tool or two for people, again, in the environments where they've either been attacked already or there's a high propensity for it and they're having to deal with it all the time. A lot of us are lucky. We don't have to deal with that all the time, but I know many, many people that have uh, issues with off-leash dogs in their areas or, or dangerous dogs roaming. So these are the tools I recommend for those folks. Uh, let me show you how the, the spray shield works. Uh, this is me spraying my girlfriend accidentally while she's videoing this. <laughs> but you can see how how far it sprays and it sprays in a straight pattern um, and Trish and I again do these seminars and web and webinars because we want you guys to practice don't just get the tools go out and practice practice all these things you learn um, over and over so it becomes really secondhand nature uh, to uh, use if in an emergency because if it's an emergency scenario and you're trying to think about what happened you're not going to remember or you're going to be slower at it. All right, moving on. We've got a couple of close quarter techniques. Um, so these are uh, kind of training techniques, but also uh, defensive handling in terms of proactive proactivity with the dog that I'm working with. So I like to do like a long feed as a distraction technique. Now, sometimes you get some nice conditioning aspects coming along for the ride, but 
you can use this if I'm walking down a city street and I have no way of increasing distance or I can't change direction or I'm in a city building, I'm trying to come down the elevator or walk up staircases, tight spaces where I need to keep my dog's focus on me. That's where a lot of dogs spill over into going over threshold because it's the moment between the treat happening and the delivery and me reaching for another treat that there's too much space there where the dogs get the treat, goes to look back and they're like, uh-oh. So distracting them with a handful of treats and they nibble the treats out of your hand is one way to go. This is just the long feed in video action. And you just like a Pez dispenser, you keep squeezing them through your hand and give them the dog one at a time. And you can use actual like cheese sticks. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. Uh, you can use food tubes if your dog is muzzled. Uh, here's a video example of that. A little side note for you trainers following along is that um, when I'm doing some of my counter conditioning work and using food when the strain, if it's a stranger danger case and the uh, dog has issues with strangers or something, sometimes I will do that long feed technique using the food ball or something else like a paper plate where I actually have the, the stranger fill that or put food in there. They put it down, they set it down and they walk away and then the dog comes over and gets that uh, food, um, especially if they're muzzled and they have issues getting food off the ground. So it's a little, uh, trick you can use when you're using food in those cases. Um, this is when you are walking down the street, again, very similar to the long feed, but you have the option of throwing treats in the grass or on the ground. And how you do it is important because let's say there's a dog or a person um, on the other side of, uh, so on my right side, let's, let's kind of picture that. So if I need to distract my dog and I can't get distance, by tossing treats away from the stimulus as far as I can, but also in a way that continues to keep her looking in that direction. So it's one treat, two treats, three treats, kind of laid out as I continue to move along and toss them in that direction. So just by virtue of where you're tossing the treats, you can focus your dog in a certain direction. If you know the other person's gonna be passing by, just focus their head in that direction so they're not um, going over threshold. Uh, visual barriers, too. So this is a uh, downtown Mystic, and this is, um, uh, we can use cars and things. So there's actually, I think this video has one where there's a dog approaching. So there's a small dog right behind. Um, and Castagna actually does have issues with small dogs. She's um, kind of gets a little worried about small white fluffy dogs. And at the same time, I'm long feeding there. So I've got a, a food tube there that I'm just feeding through. Um, let's show you that here. Um, so I'm using my body as well as the food to, to block.
So if you look at the setup too, remember short leash handling. So even if uh, she was to dart out, she wouldn't be able to get physically to the other dog or if it was an issue with people, same concept. I'm using my body to block the visual stimulus so she's less likely to see the thing going by. And I'm focusing her head so my body is in the way by doing the long feed. So you're doing multiple things to prevent your dog or the dog you're working with going over threshold because they can't see the stimulus because of what you're doing defensively. Um, and last but not least, one more technique, um, marker signals. So here's an interesting concept that I've seen play out really well over the years with clients that have uh, really well installed marker signals. So whether it's a yes or a good or a clicker, whatever the marker signal they're using is, um, I had a deaf dog client a few days ago where that the marker was a tap between the shoulder blades that was beautiful, beautifully um, installed. So uh, a good marker signal, what that does is gets the dog to turn around back towards you for the reinforcer because technically a marker is a cue to return for the reinforcer. So to come back to the handler for the reinforcer. Yes, it marks the behavior, but it's kind of is a dual purpose thing there. So um, what can happen is you can use that the moment Sometimes the dog's about to go over threshold, you catch it, you mark it there. It's almost like you can see it. They're like <sighs> taking a deep breath to, about to start barking and lunging. And then you say yes or click and the dog whips its head around to get the reinforcer. So it's like a recall cue almost, but it becomes, if it's so powerfully conditioned, you get that benefit of a quick head whip back towards you and it prevents it from going over threshold. Now I always, I always preface that with saying, don't make a habit of that because you can shape the behavior in the wrong direction if you're not careful. This is just a little before and after video just to show you um, what it looks like. So this is a little dog, Josie. She's um, barking at my lab that I brought on one of the consults. So we're increasing distance and we're um, doing some baseline, just observation with her. My lab is way over there, about 50 feet away, just to give you an idea. So we, we, I did some work with this dog. She installed the marker signal um, good with this dog. And you'll see in this video where she, this dog has issues with everything, people, bikes, strollers, other dogs, um, you name it. And in this video, there's a, you can't see the biker going by, but there's a guy on a bike, a regular bicycle going by and she's able to mark it the moment she's about to go over threshold. So it's a great way to prevent that. So right there is when she, she marks it and she flips around really nicely. That's where you want to really, that's what you're looking for. You look at that response. So she can really, very nice. All right, and just uh, I popped in a little slide on vet visits. I don't know if you did, Trish, but because um, uh, I had a question from um, a couple, uh, vet veterinarian or uh, somebody from a veterinary office emailed me. Can you talk about some of the stuff to do in a vet office? So quick Reader's Digest version. We could do a whole webinar just on this topic, but I wanted to throw this information in there, uh, especially now. A lot of the vet's office are actually doing this where um, it's one at a time. So you are waiting outside anyways in your car and they come out and let you know when it's time for your appointment. Or you might even do the appointment in your car if it's a routine uh, vaccination or something where they don't need to bring the dog in. Um, so if you have a dog that has issues inside tight spaces like the vet office or the vet office in general, um, absolutely do the appointment outside. Um, make sure you, you know, communicate with the vet that there is your dog might have issues in that kind of environment and ask if they have a different entrance. For whatever reason, a lot of times that's not thought of, but there's often more than just one entrance. There's a rear entrance that goes right to the uh, exam room sometimes. Um, and I mentioned the parking lot visits. Uh, I've done that with clients. I've, I've gone to, with clients to their vet to help them handle their dog, but also do some of the conditioning, making it a less stressful visit. Um, and we do everything outside. Um, but if you're in, if you have to go through that vet office, remember the short leash handling, right? Uh, and remember the long feed technique. So if I have to literally be on a very short leash, holding a food tube up to my dog's mouth as I'm walking through there, 
um, you're going to uh, be much more successful, less likely for the dog to go over threshold if they see another dog. Start feeding outside. So because a lot of dogs, I can hear some of the questions uh, psychically that you're like, my dog won't take food in the vet's office. He's too stressed. Well, that's a problem as well, but um, you know, visit the Fear Free uh, website. And there's plenty of tips there for that. But uh, what you, if you start feeding outside and you continue feeding, feeding, feeding as you go in, then you're more likely for the dog to continue eating as they get into the uh, exam room where, it's, where they're not near other dogs or other people. All right, last video before I turn it over to Trish. Um, and you can always just do this if you have issues with uh, safety and handling. All right, so I'm gonna uh, stop my share for a second just so I can move it over to Trish's um, uh, presentation, side of the presentation. And we're making good time, Trish, which is not usual for us. <laughs> Hooray. Um, I'm gonna start on the second slide here. Oh, you're not gonna show the shit hits the fan one again. Can you hear me all right, everybody? I can hear you well. Um, I will stay unmuted for just a second, just cue this up so it fits here better. All right, well, I'll, I'll set it up a little bit. Uh, Mike's presentation was a little bit more on what to do if a dog approaches you. Um, I'm gonna look at a little bit of shelter handling. He gave me half an hour and I'm trying to condense a two day seminar into half an hour. So I'm just gonna give you a little taste of what I, I you get with the we'll full have, uh, presentation. I don't think you'll have any complaints if you go over a little bit. <laughs> So um, yeah, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about shelter dogs. This also applies. I know a lot of you are trainers. Maybe you don't work with shelter dogs. You should work with shelter dogs. They are great teachers. Um, but you might also be working with dogs who are like these shelter dogs in that they just came from a shelter, in that they do not have the nice training that Castagna has, that you can do the left U-turn. I, I would not try that with a dog that didn't have any training because you don't know if it's going to redirect. So some of my stuff might uh, contrast a bit with Mike's, but Again, I just like everybody to have lots of techniques in the toolbox. So the more you have, the more likely it is that something's gonna pop into your head in, in an emergency situation. So when we're dealing with shelter dogs or stressed out dogs, there's, there's lots of reasons they might behave aggressively. It's a scary environment. And although there is a fear-free shelters program and I urge everybody in the shelter biz to take it, um, there is still some harsh handling. There may have been harsh handling in a previous home and they have very few choices. Uh, shelter dogs also are more likely to be suffering from pain, fear, or anxiety just based on where they came from. They might have been running loose, their paws might be sore, um, and it's a scary situation. So next, Mike has to advance my slides because <laughs> they're all on his computer. So when I do my shelter mentorship, we talk a lot about the five freedoms. So these are, um, those of you not in the animal welfare Industry might not have heard of these. I urge you to look them up. They were originally developed for uh, farm animals. So this is just a very basic that animals in our care deserve. And the piece that I concentrate on most as a shelter behavior nerd is the freedom to express normal behavior. And that's really greatly curtailed when you're living in a cage. So we'll do the next slide. So here's something that I ask people to do. So you're gonna feel a lot of empathy for this guy right now because a lot of us are locked down right now. So you're gonna feel a little bit like a shelter dog over the next couple of weeks if you're in some areas of the country. But imagine you're, you're this guy and you're in prison. There are three walls and you've got bars along the front. You can see people walking by. You've got a bed, but you've got no blanket. You've got no phone. You've got nothing to do. And you see people walking by. You're gonna start yelling at those people. Hey, 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 is anybody? <laughs> speak my language, I'm stuck in this cage, what can I do? And they'll keep on walking by. So this is kind of a setup for reactivity. This is a setup for stress. We, we, if I had to develop a machine to train reactivity in, <laughs> in dogs, it would be a shelter cage. And what if once a week they bring you a Sudoku? Would you feel any better? <laughs> when they have time, they'll bring you a Sudoku. Um, I wouldn't. I'm numerically dyslexic. Sudoku is not reinforcing to me. I would ball it up and throw it back at you. So this is, this is how a lot of these dogs are living. So next. So I'll talk a little bit about shelter dog handling. Here's the things that I think that we all need to know. 
if you volunteer or work in a shelter, you will develop some really great body language reading skills in our two-day presentation. We talk a lot about body language. That's probably the most important thing to learn is like, look, look at the stress. <coughs> Um, while Trish is having a coughing fit for just a second, I just want to also mention any questions you guys have. I saw like a couple of hands raised. So any questions you guys have, just pop them into the chat box um, and we can answer them there. We'll try to, it doesn't look like there's a whole ton of questions coming in. So we'll be able to scroll back and see those uh, questions. Um, like I saw one about the Great Dane. You probably need more like of a pop open tent <laughs> for that, Kelly. Um, so yeah. <laughs> All right, good. So yeah, um, and I will, I will concur with Trish. Body language is something we heavily focus on in our webinars, especially like uh, many of you trainers are probably looking at this picture and reading a bunch of different things, but our average clients aren't going to see that. Or even people in the industry, as you guys know, don't often see this, uh, aren't able to read the body language as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's something um, we all want to make sure we're focusing on heavily. Uh, I'm assuming my last name, Shikashio. The easy way to remember my last name is Pistachio. So think of like a pistachio or not. And I always, people always get that. Um, and when people see my name, they always think I'm Italian until they meet me. I don't know why. Um, Uh, Kelly's pack of four tends to charge the fence line when people walk by. How should I best start to prevent this? Um, <laughs> uh, work with one at a time for sure. Um, usually when you have more than one dog and they're all doing it, they're usually kind of, it's a little bit of social facilitation happening. So um, make sure you work with one at a time. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the techniques I use a lot is just, of course, reinforcing the dog in the absence of the behavior. So I would have one dog on leash at a distance as far as you wait away from the fence as you can while starting and, and reinforcing the dog for just looking at the stimulus. So we're getting that desirable behavior of noticing things going by the fence. And I reinforce the dog for noticing that mark and reinforce, much like Josie you saw in the, um, in the video, the small dog. Um, now, that particular behavior, Kelly, is very difficult to not, uh, or to manage in other words, because the dogs practice it a lot. So um, if, if we, they keep practicing, if they're allowed to charge that fence line, they're gonna keep doing it, regardless of the amount of work you're doing. Because every time they do it, they're reinforcing, they're self-reinforcing in a sense. So um, that one you have to do a lot of management on. Like, see this fence behind Trish in the picture? that would be a big problem for, for a lot of dogs. So one of the easier fixes, if possible, is visual blocking. So if you have some way of covering the fence, fence fabric is one way. Um, it's gotta be complete visual block though, because even if you we put like the slats some people use, they can still see through the fence. So um, so it's a, it's a project, I won't lie, to, to deal with those kind of issues. Um, I see some questions coming in the Q&A. Uh, how long is the webinar? Should be an hour. Let's see how long it takes Trish to uh, stop coughing. Um, let's see. Oh, I don't know if you guys can see this. Let me try to um, see if that pops up in the Q&A. But I'll read the questions back to you guys anyway. So why should you not pick up your dog if being charged by an off-leash dog? Uh, because it's very dangerous uh, in most cases. Uh, many of the severe injuries I've seen is a dog is when people pick up their small dog and then they're often getting bit here or this area of the arm because they're trying to hold their dog and their dog is getting them at the same time, the dog that's trying to attack. So they, they might be grabbing the small dog, uh, but it also makes it much more interesting. Trish calls it uh, turning a squirrel into a flying squirrel because we're picking the dog up. So, and the same thing can happen with children. Um, as some of you guys that have seen the seminar is that when somebody picks up their child, that's when the actual the attack gets worse. So whenever possible, pick up your dog quickly and put it somewhere so you're not dangling it like the, like a little prize out there for the dogs that are trying to attack. Now, worst case scenario, you can, you can if you think you can get away fast enough and pick up your small dog and get inside a car or inside of a structure or behind a fence very quickly, do that. Um, or if you have a real large jacket and you think you can hide your small dog completely, that's some of the caveats to that, but you gotta be super careful. 
Uh, Alex, one of uh, my older dogs has become quite vocal as he ages. All happy vocalization, happy back for when a person approaches. Um, if you like that, I guess, if it's happy. <laughs> um, but you can certainly, uh, if you don't like it, then you uh, can work on just like we did with Josie, where we're reinforcing uh, desirable behavior. So Trish is back. So I'll pause on the questions for a moment. You all right, Trish? <laughs> <laughs> I always, nobody's going to come to our seminars now for at least a few weeks. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, uh, oh, we lost Trisha's video for a second. There she's back. I'm trying to unmute myself here. I'm <laughs> okay. unmute myself. All right, I'll let you continue. I'm going to mute right. myself. Now. <laughs> yeah. How apropos I have a coughing fit in the middle of a coronavirus scare. Um, hopefully that's not what it is, or Joanne's going to completely divorce me. <laughs> I just coughed all over her house, but I have chamomile tea now. Um, everything's blooming here. I think it's allergies. I hope it's allergies. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about shelter dog wrangling. So, um, taking it a little bit slowly, it's hard in the shelter environment. You're always in a rush, but, um, carrying high value treats. I don't know how, why it's so hard to get shelter people to just wear a bait bag and have treats because they will get you out of so many pickles in the shelter situation. And knowing all of these leash skills and handling defensively, being prepared for the worst at all times, it's, uh, it will actually help you because sometimes the worst will happen. Next. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go through a little bit of approaching a shelter dog. Here is, um, I picked the noisiest dog in the shelter. He's a small dog, but I want you to watch his body language and watch how it changes when I change my body language. So we'll hit play. Hopefully it'll play. There we go. I'm gonna loom over him like a normal person would at the shelter. Watch, watch how he starts barking. That's very threatening body language. But I'm going to soften it. I'm going to get sideways. Bring up my high value creep. And you can experiment with this. Some dogs will sensitize rather than desensitize with repeated approaches. I actually met a dog like that this week at the shelter. But a lot of them, especially if you do it a few times a day, I used to have to take the dogs out on day three for their behavior assessment. And I would go probably five times a day by their kennel and just throw them chicken. So by day three, they might still hate everybody else, but they be, hey, chicken lady. Um, so let's move on to the next one. Sometimes people say, well, aren't you just rewarding the dog for barking if you're feeding them while they're barking? So the definition of reinforcement is it makes the behavior more likely to happen. So I want you to watch me feed this little guy over and over and tell me if I'm making the behavior more likely or less likely. And this guy's right by the door. So when he barks, every time he barks, you'll hear the whole row of dogs start barking. So if we can quiet him down, we'll actually improve everybody else's quality of life too. It's really cool to watch the quality of the barks changes with him. And you'll see his little tail come out from between his legs and start wagging towards the end of it. There's his tail. <laughs> you didn't know he had a tail. Ears are going back. You can see his body language is really softening every time I approach. Now, if it was going the other way, this is not the correct technique, or you might not need to approach as many times, or you might need a higher value treat, or today might not be the day. <laughs> but this will work with a great number of shelter dogs, just um, a few times a day, throw them the snacks, and they cannot continue to be upset by you. So when this is done, a um, little bit of shelter wrangling, um, getting difficult dogs out of a shelter. And if you're a trainer, this also works for crate handling. This is my friend, Arthur, who's an awesome handler. He is using a slip lead and I'm gonna talk more about slip leads. Sometimes they're the right tool. This is not for every dog. It's not something I use for training client dogs how to walk on a leash, but this is a pit bull from a dog fighting bust. And he thought it was really fun to jump up and shred people's clothing and grab their gloves and grab their leash and gallivant around his cage. And Arthur's taking him from the exercise area back to his kennel where he doesn't want to go. But watch how he puts the treat where he wants the dog's head to be. He's bracing the kennel with his foot so this dog can't bust through the door. And um, 
Just look how slick this handling is. So you can play the video. He's got a nice wide loop on the slip lead. Puts the dog's head where it needs to be. And the slip lead's directly behind the dog's ears and going straight up. So that's not dangling in front of his face where he can grab it. I'm sure you've met leash grabbers. Not much fun. So, um, so I'll show you the next video is him putting the dog back. So he's, again, you can see he's bracing the door with his foot. You do not want this dog running around a dog fighting shelter. He's got the leash over the dog's head and he is putting the, um, he is putting the treat where he needs the dog's head to be. So we'll play the video. And actually takes the leash off, no opportunity for tug of war. And if he had gone into that kennel and then taken the leash off and then tried to get out, it would have been a lot of fun for the dog and not much fun for the person. Go to the next one. So since we've talked a lot about small dogs, um, I went to the shelter and I asked them for some of the uh, more interesting dogs this week. And this was a little chihuahua who did not know how to walk on a leash. And I was not, I don't know this dog at all. I don't know if she's going to bite me if I'm going to pick her up. So here's a little technique for picking up a small dog that makes it a little less likely for them to bite you. There's lots of other techniques. You can use a towel, you can use oven mitts. Um, but this has worked for a lot of little kind of hoardery puppy milly dogs that I've worked with. So you can see I've got the leash in an accordion. I'm holding it in front of me and I'm holding her head forward so that she can't come around to bite me. And I'm just scooping her under the belly. Don't put your face that close to her if it might actually be a bitey dog. She was just scared and she didn't know how to walk on a leash. So I was not going to drag her into the shelter. I was just gonna carry her back in. Next. So when do we use a slip lead? As I said, it's not for every dog, but I definitely keep one in the car for catching loose dogs. I don't know if you're like me, but they seem to see me coming. <laughs> they just run out and say, this person's gonna save me. Um, dogs who are wary of put, having equipment put on them. A couple of the dogs I handled at the shelter were on front attach harnesses, so they were difficult to handle because it was very hard to get the front attach harness on them. If you've pinched, if a volunteer has pinched their armpit skin once, they can get very resistant to it. So sometimes you just need to do a quick transfer. Um, with dogs who might want to redirect, you will have a lot of control over them with a slip lead high up and tight on the back of their neck. And it can also be helpful with dogs who are hard to put back in the kennel, and I'll show you how to do that. Next. So here's the seven position. When you're holding your dog on a slip lead, you don't wanna have a whole lot of slack in between your two hands. You want the leash to be coming out of the pinky side of your hand. That'll give you a lot more strength if you need to hold the dog away from you. And um, I've got a thumb lock on my right hand, so I'm just taking a bit of the slack out. So you see that leash makes a perfect number seven. Um, that's the safest way to hold a slip lead. Next. So I'm gonna use the slip lead to move this dog from one kennel just into the next one. So he, this was one of the dogs who was on a front attached harness and he was jumpy, mouthy, wiggly, just uh, I, I must say mad props to Brother Wolf for letting me come over this week and video with a bunch of their dogs. They were really awesome and uh, stayed late and let me do whatever I wanted with them. So uh, the, all of the shelter dog video of me in the plaid shirt is courtesy of Brother Wolf in Asheville here. So I'm going to put um, the leash on him quickly, get it into seven position, pop him into the next kennel and take it off quickly. Face in there with the treat. Quickly into the next kennel. That was pretty slick. I didn't even see you do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I managed to take it off this, the top. Of you gotta come wrangle shelter dogs with me sometime, Mike. That's some experience for you. <laughs> yeah, so he was in a kennel with a barricaded bottom, and that kind of was kind of creepy. All of the dogs they gave me to work with had those kennels, all of their uh, more difficult dogs which is great because they can't see the dogs walking by, but it's also not good because they can't see the dogs walking by and you kind of get pogo dog. So, um, but I got to move back to where he should be. Next. 
So uh, at, our, at our seminars, we talk a lot about using your body weight to teach the dog that, or to convince the dog that you're a lot stronger than you are. I'm not a huge person. I don't work out as much as Mike does, but I can convince a dog that I'm pretty strong just based on how I use my body weight. So this is my friend Danielle at Champagne um, Humane Society in Illinois. And I told her that she, this is not a trained dog. We're just walking towards the um, play yard with this random shelter pit bull. And I said, just act like a volunteer and let the dog pull you. And you will see she's a method actress. She's also got the leash wrapped around her hand a million times. Don't do this. This is dangerous. This is acting. So um, play the video. So you can see when the dog pulls and gets some give, look how much fun this is. The dog's pulling and pulling and pulling. Yay, that worked. I pulled and I got to go to the play yard. So again, don't wrap the leash like this. This is what not to do. But when the dog thinks they're tied to a willow tree and they pull and they get that give, they're going to keep pulling. So when I'm walking the dog, I want them to think they're attached to an oak tree. So we'll go to the next slide. So this is Danielle again. You'll see her using the belly button lock that Mike talked about. And she's walking the same dog towards the play yard. This is not a trained dog. <laughs> play the video. Right, towards the play yard. Yay, play yard. So she gets that first pull. And it's like hitting a brick wall. She does not get any give. Look at that. She's like, well, there's no point in pulling this person. So just um, changing how you handle the dogs can, I, I, I'm sure you've all had clients say this, like, dog's so good for you. Why doesn't she do that for me? It's, it's because of how we handle. Next. So I'll talk a little bit about leash grabbers. This is something that will happen with client dogs as well as shelter dogs. It's a really popular game in the shelter world. And this is one reason I like the slip leads, especially if you're not walking them very far. There's Theodore on the left with a properly fitted left side slip lead. If you don't know the difference between how you fit a slip lead when you handle on the left versus how you fit a slip lead when you handle on the right, um, you need to find somebody over the age of 40 to teach you. Um, but that's a proper left side slip lead. So what's wrong with the dog on the right? If he was a leash grabber, like I love the front attach harnesses, they're great for a lot of leash pullers, but if he likes to play tug of war, where is that leash? It's right in front of his mouth and it can be really hard to get out of his mouth. And when you do get it out of his mouth, then he's gonna grab it again. So um, sometimes a change of equipment, a head halter or a, a regular collar might be better than the front attach for these guys, or even a back attach harness might work if they're not too strong. Um, do I tend to avoid bungee leads? Yes, I do. Um, go ahead. So here's something to think about. So if I'm walking, if I'm walking a horse past something that is scary, I would have, you know, horse, then person, then scary thing. But if you've got a dog, and I saw a lot of volunteers doing this uh, this week at the shelter, I need to go back and do some more training. Um, What's wrong with this picture? Here's dog and then a person and then a row of kennels. What is going to happen? Let's go to the next slide. Would this be better? The person and then the dog and then the row of kennels. Um, in, for the most part, this is how I walk the dog. There would be a leash on that dog also. I was not that slick with my graphics on this one. But this is a lot safer for you but go to the next slide and I'll show you an even better way. This is better. So if you've only got one row of kennels, take the dog on the kennel side as far from the kennels as you can, because if you don't, next slide, you're going to get redirected on. So um, the inside U-turn that Mike did with Castagna, that, that worked great with her and it's safer for her, but if you're working with a dog who might redirect, and a lot of shelter dogs think it's pretty fun to put their teeth into you right above your knee. Some of you in the chat know what this feels like. Um, switch up your handling, handle the dog on the other side and you'll be safer. Next. Now what do we do? <laughs> we have dogs on both sides. I'll show you some video of me doing this well and me doing this not so well in, in the next few slides. I'll show you how, how to do this. So I'm going to do a little bit of quick and dirty head halter acclimation. This was um, the most reactive dog in the shelter. She is on a front attach harness. They have not done the head halter fitting or acclimation with her. I'm like, well, 
you let me play with your dog and I will have her walking on a head halter before I give her back to you. So can you do this in one day? Mike has a good video of, of some quick and dirty head halter acclimation. We both know how to do this um, quickly if you need to. And if you've got a dog who is reactive and who might redirect, um, this is the best tool. You can control their mouth, you can control where they're looking, you can keep them good and close to you. And um, this uh, really rocked her world. Of course, if you have time and you have a shelter, uh, a regular owned dog, um, go ahead and do the slower acclimation. But this dog needed it done today, <laughs> so I did it. So um, here I am fitting, the fitting her with the head halter. You'll see I've got a handful of food and um, I've sort of eyeballed it and got it fitted well enough that she can't get it off. And play the video and you'll see how I get, get it clipped on. So I've got the leash pre-attached. I'm going to guide her in with the food. <laughs> it's gonna jump at my videographer. This was the wildest one they had yes, this week. Got it over her nose while she's eating the food. And I'm gonna clip it behind her ear. And I have guessed wrong at the size, so I'm sizing quickly. I wish I had another handful of food. But there you go, I got it on her quickly and my leash is already attached so I can um, pick it up and get her out. So, you know, some of this is not the prettiest handling, but sometimes you just need to get the job done. So next. So we walked her out to the yard and this dog was an expert at moving the leash to the wrong side of her head. So what side should the leash be on? Um, you want the leash to be on the same side as you are and she kept getting it onto her left side. So you'll see me flip the leash around several times in this video. Try to get it on the correct side. So I have a little more control. So that's the wrong side. Flip it around and I'm still same side handling her because she's a rowdy one. But there, there were a couple little flips to get the to keep the leash where I have control of her. She was trying really hard to make sure I didn't have control of her. So I, I taught her that when you follow where the leash goes, you get a cookie. She did that pretty well for me. And then I had my friend Kat work with her a little bit just to get the concept in that this works with other people as well. So next. So here's Kat putting just a little bit of gentle pressure on her nose and then feeding her in the direction that she's being asked to move. And you can get a dog working on a head halter pretty quickly. A lot of dogs, not all of them, but a lot of them. And play that. So a little bit of pressure and then feed in the direction of the pressure. And watch this next turn. Of course, I already warmed this dog up, but look at that. She's just following right along. You want the leash hanging in a J almost all the time when they're on a head halter. You do not want to teach them to, to lean into it. Next. So this is the second, oh no, this is the same dog. Okay, so I'm gonna put her back in the shelter and I have my long feed tool. This was a piece of string cheese. Both of the difficult dogs I worked with this week were really grabbing the treat hard. So I was wishing I had a food tube or something. Um, trouble with squeezed cheese and food tubes in the shelter is the shelter vets don't want you using it on one dog and then using it on the other dog. So that's why I like pepperonis or string cheese. So you'll see me get chomped a few times because she's taking treats hard. This is hard for her going back in. Next, uh, play it. So string cheese, trying to keep the leash in a J, going through the door back into the shelter. Cat is videoing, so I don't need to shut the door, which was kind of nice with this dog because that's a tricky spot. So where do I have the dog? There's kennels on both sides, and I am absolutely evenly spin splitting the difference. This is the good video. I'll show you me doing it wrong with the next dog, or not as well with the next dog. The most reactive dog in that kennel was the first dog on the right when you come through the door. So that's the reason I handled the next dog not quite as well. So this is the other... Um, meatball in the shelter. He's jumpy and mouthy. He's not reactive. He doesn't mind other dogs, but um, he's tricky to uh, he's tricky to wrangle. So I was handling him on a slick lead, and I'm going to show you the figure eight technique to put him back into the kennel. So you'll see me put the blue slip lead on him, and then I'm going to use the pink leash to take the blue leash off when he gets into his kennel. Now tell me what I'm doing wrong when I walk him down the aisle. <laughs> I've shown you what it looks like when it's done right. This is not hideous, but I, I could have done it better. So we're going from the play yard where we've been throwing a ball around, doing a bit of work with him. 
There's my seven position. I've got the leash straight up behind his ears. I'm gonna pull the stopper on the leash so that I'll be able to easily take that leash off when I put him back in. I'm gonna to have to keep a little bit of upward pressure so that he doesn't get out of that leash. This is not a beginner technique. And you see how loose the pink leash is? I do not wanna accidentally pull the wrong leash with this dog, but I also don't wanna be fiddling around in front of his kennel to put the release leash on. We're going back in through the back door and getting my string cheese ready. Because you might as well make the trip back fun for him. This guy doesn't see so well, plus he's pretty excited. So he was, he was taking treats hard and that's a good way to measure how aroused the dog is. So what's wrong with my handling here? <laughs> that was way too close to the left side. Um, the right side dog was barking a lot when I went in. <laughs> So I didn't have to put my hands in with him. And it can be that fast. Oh, there's a little request just to play that one back again. So or the beginning of the figure eight leash again. So um you can pre-attach it if you if you have a really re uh, difficult dog. Sometimes with feral dogs, I'll attach the release leash before I even put the slip lead on. This guy's just a meatball, so I'm just going to do it right here. I'm going to get my leashes where it needs to be. I've got a thumb lock on it. I'm going to attach the release leash, switch hands so that I'm same side handling. And this is why you need to practice all of this. It, it, it can be this easy if you're good at it, but um, my first few times using this technique, it was not this slick. So I can move along, you guys, have, or do you want to see him? You want to see him being put back in? I was pretty speedy with this one. You might not have seen it the first time. Now you have to watch my bad handling again. I'm too close to the left side. <laughs> I'll skip that. I'll put a handling fire where you get the lead off. <laughs> there we go. Pop him in. Hold him in the seat. I don't have to put my hands in um, to try to get the leash off. I'm sure you've all seen that in the shelter, people sort of sticking their finger in and trying to yank the leash off. And that movement can be really arousing to dogs. So with the leash grabbers, um, this is something a lot of dogs will do because it's fun. You can do a lot with the equipment, with your handling, with redirection, with making the leash taste bad, using a chain leash. Um, lots of different ways you can do it. I'm just gonna show you two in the next two videos. So this is my friend Allie, who's a kick-ass handler, and she is going, I would normally use a longer toy, a rope toy, uh, a longer squeaky snake, something so that my hand's not so close, but this was this dog's favorite toy, so that's what she's using. You can see she's got um, her slip lead in her right hand and she's already made the loop, so she just needs to pop the door open, stuff that in his mouth, and get him to the play yard. And this was a dog who was almost euthanized for extreme, extreme mouthiness in the shelter. He was really not doing well, but um, Allie was able to keep him sane long enough to get him out to uh, rescue, and he did, he did fine. This was all shelter behavior, so play the video. Well, he dropped his ball. That's why she let him get that close to the kennel. She needed him to have the ball in his mouth. Um, somebody wanted to know why the dog was not getting as much treating walking through the kennel. Um, that dog was, he had something wrong with his eyes. He didn't see very well. So when he took treats, he took them really hard. <laughs> so I had experienced that enough times in the play yard. I wasn't going to do that again. But if, um, if he'd been a little, a little gentler, he might have got more treats. Next. So um, the other thing you can, one of many other things you can do with leash grabbers is you can take your big handful of treats and get them to let go of the leash for a treat. So here's Ali doing a trade for a treat. So you can see she let him sniff the treats. She, he saw she had something really good and then she scattered them on the ground. Do I ever use lick sticks for the dogs or use gloves for treating? Uh, those are also options. And I did have gloves in my back pocket, but um, 
Yeah, it's a double-edged sword. You, you're always dealing with disease in shelters. We are getting more familiar with this as humans now too. Next. So I'll talk a little bit about what to do. Mike went into what to do if dogs are approaching your dog on a walk. I'm gonna go into a little bit of my dog fight stuff. I don't have time for the full, <laughs> the full um, dog fight speech, but I'll just give you a few techniques if the dog is actually biting your dog. Um, knowing the right tools and techniques, again, you can use the environment. Um, anything in the environment can be a tool to break up a dog fight. Next. So here's the whole list of fight kit tools. These are things that I would want to have on hand in a shelter. Obviously, you're not going to go for a walk with this. But if you've got a dog fight in your home, you've got a dog fight in your yard, you've got a dog fight on the walk, you might have something from this list that you can use. So when dogs are meeting, I keep them both on dragging leashes. You might need to use a slip lead to um, secure one or both dogs when you get them apart. You can get water a lot of places. <laughs> you might be carrying one of these. Um, lots of ways to make noise, um, different sprays you might wanna carry and different ways to break the block the vision. And I'll show you how to use a brake stick at the end. Next. Um, what not to do. So here's all the things that we naturally want to do as humans when we see teeth. Um, we, it is a scary, scary thing. Um, if you grab the collar, guess where dogs are biting one another in a dog fight? It's mostly around the face and neck. So I have been bitten once, sticking my hand on a dog's collar. That was 1999. Haven't done it since. Do not hit, kick, or punch a dog who is biting because adding pain will make them bite harder. It's very tempting to try to pry mouths open, but those teeth are super sharp and they are made for ripping through meat and bone and guess what your fingers are made out of. Try not to put your body in between the dogs. If you have to break up a fight, try to do it from the back. And we've talked a lot about <laughs> not picking up small dogs. Next. The thing to remember with a dog fight is you have time. Like if you don't have your tool right on you, I had a bad dog fight in my house a little over a year ago, a foster dog had hold of my um, little yellow dog, and I could, t I could see in one instant that I was not going to break that fight up by pulling on either dog. It was a gripping fight. I knew I had my brake stick in the car, and I ran out and got the right tool and came back and was able to break it up fairly quickly. Uh, professional dog fights can go on for an hour, two hours. Um, so with equally matched dogs, it may be better to go and get the tool and come back, you know, if it's not six blocks away. The exceptions are if the blood flow or airway is blocked or if it's a large dog, small dog situation, you may not have time. But uh, the tools will help you be safe and you should all have fight kits if you ever have more than one dog in contact. <laughs> Next. So here's some different ways to get water. You could, I have used the dog dish. <laughs> Um, in the shelters, you often have the hose and play yards in your, in your yard. Um, fire extinguishers can work. Um, I had, we had somebody who came to our seminar a few years ago who was able to break up a fight in the dog park just with her water bottle. Just dump it on their head or dump it down their throat and a lot of dogs will let go. Next. You can also make noise. Again, this is not for training dogs. We don't shake cans at dogs to make them sit. But if you, um, if you have a noisemaker that can startle the dogs into letting go, you may be able to get hold of one. And, and the goal is to get one of the dogs behind a door through a gate into a car somewhere that they can't get back to the other dog. Because there is nothing worse than having them re-engage. Um, you can also, if it's in your, in your kitchen, you can grab pots or bowls. We often have bowls in the shelter, those metal bowls, clang them behind their heads. Uh, air horns can be super effective. They're, um, they will make your ears ring. And some dogs will listen to your voice. I, I have broken up fights with um, dogs who know me well, just with the voice of mom. Next. If you are going to get two dogs to break up a fight, um, the wheelbarrow is one technique you can use. You need to hold the dog at the top of their thighs. I'm not grabbing the dog's abdomen. <laughs> it's the top of the thighs. And then you're going to spin um, and use a centrifugal force to sort of get the dog not facing the other dog and again through a gate get a barrier in between them get a leash on them this dog's actually has a drag leash on her so once i did the wheelbarrow it was easy to grab the leash 
or step on the leash, it's a little safer. Next. So your last ditch, um, if you have dogs, this is only for dogs who are doing a gripping fight. If they're sort of slash and dash and grabbing at each other, you're not gonna go in like Zorro with your brake stick and try to break it up. This is only for gripping fights. Super important um, before you use a brake stick to get a dog to let go. You can also use tent pegs, door stoppers. There aren't a lot of things that are the right shape to do this. I have tried this with, you know, chuck it, <laughs> other tools that I found, sticks. Um, you really need the right tool. So th this is only for gripping fights. This is not a beginner technique, but, um, and all of the articles on the internet say, put the brake stick behind the dog's molars. Uh, you can't even put your pinky finger behind your dog's molars. The correct place for a brake stick is behind the dog's canine teeth. You know, they've got all those little teeth there. That's what, it, that's what that hole was made for. So if the dog who's gripping, you're gonna stand over them with your knees um, between their rib cage and their hips. You're gonna grab the dog's scruff or their collar. I've had collars break, including the dog who was biting my dog in the house last year. Um, I've never had a scruff break, so you might wanna do the scruff grab. Work the, the stick in behind the dog's teeth, and then you're gonna twist it to get the dog to release. And then you're going to break their eye contact, get them through a door, get a leash on them, get them out of the situation. So there's a couple different types of brake sticks and where to get them. So I'll show you a video of um, my old boss, Dr. Pam Reed. He weighs 95 pounds soaking wet and she is able to get a pretty big dog to let go using a brake stick. At the ASPCA, we use stuffed dogs to as, as a first assessment of fighting dogs. Stuffed dogs are not good for assessing normal dogs, but they're pretty predictive with the fighting dogs. So I was really lucky to get a lot of my break stick practice in where the other dog was not alive and screaming. It's much easier that way. So play the video. She's putting it right behind the dog's um, canines. And yes, you can break teeth with this. If it's a matter of life and death, I would rather break a dog's teeth than um, have them severely injure the other dog. And you'll see she keeps him in control position. There was a question about redirected bites. You can see he would redirect. Most fighting dogs won't, but this guy's flailing around. If you are holding the dog, you can see she's got a scruff and a collar with him. There, there is no way for the dog to whip around and, and grab you if you are in control position. And um, if, if, you are, if she was standing beside the dog holding him, he absolutely could have come around and bit her. Bite, but um, that worked pretty well. So um, that's all I've got for you guys. Let me see if there's any more questions in the chat about break sticks. There's a few, and then also if you pull up your Q&A box there, so. Uh, so yeah, uh, okay. I, we, I pulled up the contact slide, so that's all of our contact info if you guys want to get in touch. Uh, but now we'll do some Q&A for a little bit. Uh, on it. So let's see, just want to make sure we didn't miss any other, some of the other questions were coming in. So we also have this for you guys that entered into the Q&A box, don't worry, we'll get to those as well. Uh, I've got them. Have you answered any of them in your side on your side or uh, not really? There was a mention about the um, the uh, using treats when a dog is grabbing the leash. I mean, yeah, theoretically we could reinforce the behavior, uh, but it's kind of the lesser of two evils at that moment. Now, one of the things I want to mention too is like remember the two contexts that Trish and I are talking about. I work. Uh, and that's why we present together because it's a nice like blending of two worlds. So I work with clients, private clients. I uh, step in a shelter once in a while, especially if Trish drags me into one. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I work in that world. So I have the luxury of controlling the environment, taking time, like, like a head halter acclimation, for instance. I have the luxury of doing that and having the client do that over multiple days, weeks, or even months if it takes that. Trish is in the shelter world. So we'll keep that in mind as you're watching and kind of digesting this information is that she has sometimes seconds to do some of the things she does or doesn't have the same luxury of time or clients doing that work. So 
Trish could go in and acclimate every single dog to head holder, but then she wouldn't be able to work and give you guys these webinars. So Yeah, um, and I, I will tell you that dog that I did the instant acclimation, she had been at the shelter for a month. She was deteriorating. She was getting more reactive. They had still not had time to do the acclimation. And I think by doing the rapid acclimation and having the tool fitted for her for the next person, she is going to practice that less. And that's at this time, this is a, you know, that can be a matter of life and death for a dog. So would I do that with a client dog? No. <laughs> um, do I necessarily have all of the tools and the peanut butter and the licky mat and all of the stuff? Not that day. So it's, it's a little more of a cowboy situation, but again, this is a great reason to go to the shelter and, and work with the dogs and bring the tools, try them out with dogs who are not owned by people. And uh, you will get some really great handling chops <laughs> working with um, dogs who know nothing at all. They're a lot of fun and um, it's very good for the dogs. Uh, let see, Chris had a question about tips on brake sticks without a redirected bite. Yeah, that's, the, you've got to be in control position. You are not going to be standing beside the dog flailing around with that. If the dog is in control position, you've got the scruff, you're, you've, you're standing over the dog with their waist between your knees. You could see with that dog with Pam, she was, he was trying to get around and he could not. Um, really, really important. I've, I've learned that one the hard way. Got to be in control position. Um, but uh, are you worried about breaking teeth? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Just, it's one of the potentials. So, but proper use of the brake stick. So not just, you know, yeah, doing and this, is, this is a uh, soft plastic. So the, the one time I saw teeth broken was with a dog who had uh, genetically bad teeth. <laughs> Mostly with a young, healthy dog, you're not going to hurt the dog if you have a proper um, plastic brake stick. I wouldn't, um, there are people who stick metal batons in their mouths and try to try to get them to let go that that will cause a lot more damage and also that doesn't work so um, um yeah, it's a cutting board material for anybody that doesn't know uh, yeah. those brake sticks um a good question from christine why are stuffed dogs effective for assessing fighting dogs but not other dogs well that's actually a yeah that's actually that's based on that's based on research so um when pam Reed and Kristen Collins and I assessed the Missouri 500 dogs in 2009. We did a study comparing what the dog did with a stuffed dog to what they did with a real dog to what they did with a control object. And we had an 83% correlation between um, dogs who showed aggression towards the stuffed dog and dogs who showed aggression towards the real dog. It's really hard to get people to volunteer their dogs to help you assess these fighting dogs. Um, I wouldn't send my dog to the shelter and say, here, let's, uh, let's throw 20 fighting dogs at him today and see if they really want to bite him. It's just not safe. There often aren't that many friendly dogs you can use and you can ruin them by, by even if the dog's muzzled, even if it's from a distance, having dogs go off at them all day. So it was great to find out that the stuffed dog was an effective tool. And there's actually a study on um, using them with a normal shelter dog population. And if they're friendly, they will be friendly towards the, the they are more likely to be friendly towards the stuffed dog. If they, are, if they show aggression towards the stuffed dogs, it doesn't mean they're going to show aggression towards the real dogs. So shelter people need to get comfortable with introducing dogs to real dogs. Right. I'm going to jump over to the Q&A box just because we had some questions earlier on. I don't want to miss those. Um, just jumping back to Alex's question about um, her, her younger dog triggers into reactive barking if the, he hears the older dog bark at all what was the best way to go about this trigger um so short answer i with any stimulus that um triggers that behavior so um the antecedent there is your older dog barking um counter conditioning the younger one you are so you are actually on the right track so you you that one's a little harder to set up though because you can't unless you literally train your dog to old, older dog to bark so it's more i wouldn't I wouldn't focus on that. I would focus on just being ready when those scenarios present themselves. So pick a time of day where it's more likely to happen and then condition the younger one, you know, and have the younger one next to you, maybe even on a leash. So you should, they, the younger one doesn't go run, run over to see what's going on. And every time the older dog barks and, and I start to catch that dog being quiet, but like, good feed, good feed, good feed. 
or mark and feed the quiet behavior. And you can even start with, even if there's barking, you can often it shifts in the other direction. So don't be too worried about reinforcing that particular type of barking, provided it's not uh, attention seeking uh, barking towards you. Uh, Therese's question about any advice for a dog who has learned all the defensive handling cues, then it immediately looks for the source. Uh, I'm not sure I understand that question. Any advice for a dog who has learned all the defensive handling cues and immediately looks for the source? Do you mean to start, do you get, are you interpreting that one, Trish? I'm not sure if I understand that one. Yeah, hang on. I'm, I'm, I'm looking up a study. Somebody wanted the study. Okay. Of dogs. <laughs> Answer a couple more. Let me see. Okay. But maybe if you can clarify that in the chat, um, Therese. Um, any tricks getting your dog onto a bus past the driver? Ooh, <laughs> tough one. That's an interesting one, yeah. Um, long feed, you know, so, um, and then visual block if you can. Um, visual block doesn't have to be much. It could be as much as like a handbag or something that you're carrying that you quickly just put in and you kind of picture that. Now you got to practice that a bunch of times before you try it with the bus driver so you don't lose the leash or anything. But if you block the visual and long feed, that often is getting you past that step. Um, that's a that's an interesting one though. Um, Kelly's had a dog charge me while walking two of my dogs one day and I screamed at the other dog then because I didn't want my dogs to get to the other dog. Um, I was eventually drug on the ground, drug down to the ground by my dogs, but I refused to let them go in an effort to maintain some control. Um, I think we answered some of that question. So is there anything else you could do? I, I like to have the tools at the ready. So like if I've got a dog approaching me and I've got to use the spray shield or I use, I'm using one of the other tools that I have, that prevents it um, a lot from happening. Now, you want to have good defensive handling skills with your own dog, especially if it's a Great Dane and a large one, you have to have um, control. Um, you might need um, to use something that's going to give you more control, like a front clip harness or a head halter even in those cases. For clients that are getting drugged down to the ground, we have to think of the human side of the relationship too. So um, head halter could absolutely be useful there. And sometimes that's not even enough. So you have to have the hip technique using the leash very close to you um, and then having the other tools ready to go. Um, Elaine has got a dog that also is kennel reactive. He will not take treats or any food when a person comes up to the kennel. Um, so me, I, I'm assuming you mean the crate or maybe outdoor kennel. So with those, it's distance is always your friend. Keep a distance, work with your dog either just on the outside yourself and have people approach from 50 yards away if you have to and you're gonna work with your dog and gradually take steps towards decreasing the distance. Um, or sometimes the easier fix is the visual block. Just put something, if it's a crate, cover the crate if you have people coming over, or move the crate location. Uh, so that way the dog isn't practicing the behavior because crates, kennels, they're very restrictive in movement and you have the barrier issue too. Um, I think we had answered Jessica's question a little bit about what, what would you do um, if the owners get, get attacked. So we kind of talked about breaking up dog fights and warding off uh, off-leash dogs. Chris, uh, her husband's vet practice um, offers daycare. The daycare staff are not necessarily skilled in reading body language. They don't provide dogs any counter conditioning desensitization because they are not trainers. In a lot of cases, they are getting bitten, mostly redirected by due to something happening in the environment. What tips do you have for them from day to day? And what advice? I'll, I'll let you take that question. <laughs> the daycare environment for staff safety and uh, dogs that redirect. It's kind of similar to the, to the shelter stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, send them to our workshop. <laughs> that's, that's a <laughs> big question. I, I really, 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 really like head halters for um, dogs who might redirect. And um, if you don't have time to acclimate or if the dog isn't responsive to it, um, you may need to muzzle them. But it, it's hard to know which dogs are going to bite. Um, the straight arm technique to hold the dog away from you. So you're going to start with your arm straight out before you walk them past the other dogs. Also not getting between the dog and what they're trying to bite. So um, yeah, come, come to our workshop. <laughs> We've got a, this is a very That's tiny a broad question, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, 
couple of questions about the recording, if that's going to be accessible. This is being recorded and it will be um, accessible. I believe the same link, but if not, um, I will post it all over social media on how to get access to the recording. So not to worry if you showed up late, there will be a recording. Um, when a dog gets mouthy and first couple of tricks aren't working, you now have the dog lead around a tree. So that's uh, interesting. Uh, she, she's using the back tie technique to get the dog away from you. Um, how much time for you, for the dog to start again? Um, interesting questions like, I guess really it's, it's an amount of time. It's really more the behavior we're waiting to see change, right, Trish? Um, like dog, super mouthy dog is in, we can't, the dog's not taking food, dog's not trading for food, grabbing the leash, grabbing you. Um, and, yeah. and you end up having to back tie because you're getting tired and, uh, is there yeah, if if you can get them totally tied, you can go back, back and get a second person and a second leash. That can be helpful. Yeah. Um, something else in the dog's mouth, if you're wearing a hat, if you're wearing gloves, if you've got something you can stuff in their mouth that's not the leash or you. A lot of it is where you have the leash. If you can get um, this, if you have a slip lead and you can get it right up behind the dog's ears, I am really good at not getting my slip lead um, bitten by just where I have my hand. Um, we had a question about preventing shaking when the dog, when you're in control position. Yeah, you, if you've got hold of the collar or the scruff, you can sort of stabilize the head a bit that way as well. But you need to get that grip released as soon as you can with either the tools, um, with some of the tools we've given you. I'm just going to repaste your, the link you sent me. Trish, I think you just sent it to me. So. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. To re, just Teresa was clarifying her other question. Um, what, what I mean is that as soon as I start to execute defensive handling, good question. It looks like a cue to my dog for reason, source, as to cause. Yes. So absolutely. Things we do can absolutely become precursors or cues for our dog to start reacting. So um, you have to be very careful about that. And you might have to actually start to condition and move away from these cues, teach your dog that those cues predict food. So you might have to backpedal a little bit in terms of everything you're doing. So you add in other dogs, plus you maybe holding your breath or pulling up on the leash or um, whatever you're doing as the cue, you have to start to condition those. All right, I'm gonna do this when no other dogs are around and it's gonna predict a treat. So whether it's your muscle memory of going, what a lot of people do is they pull their hands up, I will start to do that and then be, and I'll try to also manage my own behavior. Um, but if it's an absolute necessary defensive handling skill, like a U-turn or something, we've got to do conditioning work there that says, okay, this could happen, but it's not always going to happen around other dogs. And it happens and it predicts something good is going to happen from now on. So, um, so thank you for clarifying that. That's actually a great question. Uh, is there a good technique if an off lead approaches my on lead and dog and grabs and there's no owner in sight? Um, tools, the tools you have, if you have the brake stick and the spray shield and those things, you might, I mean, if it's a real bad situation, you might have to take the leash off of your dog or just let your dog get out of there while you go into control position with the attacking dog, get the, your own dog's leash and use that to, um, perhaps back tie that dog, right? Uh, until you find the owner or, or you can uh, call somebody to help because, um, your, your main focus is obviously on the dog that's attacking, uh, not necessarily always on your own dog in that kind of a situation. Um, so we asked about the study, we posted that. Uh, we talked about where it's gonna be posted. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, backing up to a question, where did it just go? Elizabeth is a vet tech, or she had a vet tech tell me that you could grab a chair with legs and put it over one of the dogs to break up a fight. I think in a slash and dash fight, you know, dogs are biting and releasing, so not in a bite and hold fight. You can absolutely use a chair in the sense that you're just putting an object in between the dogs to try to herd one of the dogs back. Um, there's better objects you could probably use, but even a folding metal chair is going to keep your hands out get of the door in between them. Yeah, yeah, this is not an exhaustive list of everything we know. This is <laughs> yeah, usually this that just just the dog fight thing we can talk about for a couple hours. So. Um, so, so the question about uh, Shonda has been to our seminar and she's wondering about inter internship style education. 
Uh, Trish, if you're looking at sh shelter stuff, Trish does her shelter behavior mentorship. And if you're looking at more private client stuff, I have my uh, aggression in dogs master course. So there are online education options for both, depending on she, what she's you're looking doing. for hands on. And I would really highly recommend um, go to the shelter, <laughs> just work yeah, dogs. combination of yeah, that's a where a lot of my hands on. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm showing you, I learn working in the shelter. I did not make any of this stuff up. This is stuff that I have learned from other people who worked with difficult dogs. Um, yeah, so fostering dogs. If oh, you guys yeah. can't work in the shelter is another way to do it. And right now, all of the shelters need dogs fostered. They're, they're going to have to depopulate shelters if, um, if this shutdown goes on for too long. So um, take one home, place it, <laughs> teach it some stuff. I'm going to grab a couple more questions here off the Q&A and then um, we'll probably wrap it up after that just because we're running pretty late. I yep. know it's uh, been a long day, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so Alex, one of my older dogs has become quite vocal as he ages. Uh, I think I might have answered that one before. before. That was uh, part of the uh, when the other the younger, younger dog was also barking, <laughs> uh, I believe. And Patricia, uh, Okay, so yeah, please please do share this webinar with your uh, your colleagues there um, because it's anytime Trish and I do this stuff, we always say if we can just have one person avoid a dog bite, um, then it, it's it makes it all worthwhile for us. So um, all right, I think I think we've got them all. So. Um, uh, Tom is wondering if you're doing the mentoring again this year, Trish, the shelter mentorship? Yeah, I am. Um, I usually run it a couple times a year. I just finished one in January. Um, I'm not quite sure. I haven't got the next one scheduled yet, but um, if you follow my page, Macmillan Animal Behavior, I will absolutely post it there. And um, if you've ever been to one of our um, in-person workshops, um, Joanne will probably send you a reminder when that, when that comes up. She did that this time around and I had more people than I have ever had. It was really awesome from countries all over the world. Um, really great way to network with people. Yeah. Um, so just a couple final notes before we sign off. Uh, to, if, you, if you're interested in getting the recording for this webinar, you need the link. Um, the best way to get it is probably following my personal Facebook page. So just look for Michael Shikashi on Facebook. Uh, I'm maxed out on my friends list, so but you can follow me and I'll post it there and you guys will see that. Uh, posting there um, for anybody in the master course I'll also post it there and um, on my website for future webinars as well so there's a bunch of webinars coming up I mentioned the couple free ones on um, uh, coping during this uh, this crisis and the uh, how to do remote consultations webinars that are free um, I've got a few coming up on livestock guardian dogs and how to work with their aggression how to understand them uh, dog versus cat aggression, or dog to cat aggression, um, recognizing pain in dogs. And then we, of course, um, we'll be launching uh, live streaming for the actual full aggression in dogs workshop that Trish and I do. We're having to do that for the next few locations because they've all, obviously we can't go there. So we're doing everything live streaming. We'll make an announcement for that too. The first one we're gonna do a test run. So that one's not open for registration, but future full aggression dogs workshops with all the leash handling and all the bells and whistles will be available uh, on some live streaming options for you guys that can't uh, attend the live stuff in person, which none of us can right now. So, um, all right, Trish, um, anything else to add? Um, yeah, you can follow my pages too. Joanne just dropped them all in the chat, Macmillan Animal Behavior. Um, I still have room for a few friends. If you want to friend me on Facebook, make sure you get the right Trish Macmillan. I believe I have a chicken on my shoulder this week in my profile pic. Um, I'm going to get Joanne to unblock her video so she can say hi to you. Sorry. Since, uh, she's being all modest here. She's been monitoring <laughs> the chat and dropping things in. So there she is. She's hey, everybody. <laughs> our uh, speaking agent. She has uh, done an amazing job of uh, getting the seminar up and running, and she is going to do an amazing job of making it happen online pretty soon. So, um, it's going to be going to be an interesting year, but we want to continue getting the education out there. It's it's really our mission in life to keep people safe um, when they're working with aggressive dogs. 
Yeah. So, all right. Stay tuned. The, the recording will be up. Zoom is slow. I just want to make a note, side note. Zoom is a, being a little slow on processing videos right now. So it could take a few days even to get this up, but uh, not to worry. It will be viewable again if you missed anything or want to watch the techniques back. So thanks everybody for joining. Um, I, everybody, I hope everybody stays safe and healthy uh, and happy at home while we go through this. Um, any questions, feel free to um, tag me or Trish or get us on Facebook. Um, or through our websites. So, all right, guys, gonna wrap it up there. And thanks to Joanne for the tea that stopped my coughing fit. I really don't think I have COVID. I think it was just uh, allergies. <laughs> but I'll see you again. All right. Bye, everybody.